morning, Malta and Goes, and welcome to another edition of Love and Daily. I am Jonathan Chilia. I'm joined by my co-host, Tim Diakono, and today is St. Joseph's Day. It is. It's a public holiday, but you wouldn't really notice, judging from how empty the streets are. I mean, it's kind of weird, you know, driving over here to the office. Obviously, Love and Malta is on quarantine. Everyone's working from home, though we did run into do Love and um, Daily, but driving here the street. The streets are totally empty. It's quite a nice day, but people stay inside. Do not go out to enjoy the day today. I mean, follow official guidelines. Let's stay healthy. We are under the outbreak of the coronavirus, so let's keep that in mind. I wonder if people are appreciating traffic yet. Oh man, I mean, <laughs> I forgot what it feels like to be stuck in traffic. It is an incredible feeling. Um, before we move on to our first story, just a quick clarification for a story we wrote about yesterday, we, we discussed yesterday. Um, in regards to the body that was found in Santa Lucia, I think we um, had said on Love and Daily that the body was dismembered. It was not. It was not dismembered. And while the person was known to police, he isn't suspected of being involved in any criminal activity. So just a quick clarification. Yeah. Moving on to our first story. So, um, last night, the Prime Minister, Robert Abela, announced a 1.8 billion stimulus package to help businesses deal with the inevitable economic fallout of the coronavirus crisis. And as as expected this 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 package was um, you know was kind of received in a lukewarm manner right mm -hmm. so some people obviously praised the prime minister some said no we're not doing enough and it's a very it's very early to tell um, what its effects are going to be um, it's basically consists of loan guarantee of bank guarantees um, tax deferrals um, and other schemes to help um, self-employed people to help uh, parents who have to stay at home and cannot work from home because obviously schools are out so they have to, so they have to miss quite a few weeks of, of work. Mm -hmm. It um, pays employers who um, for, the quarantine, for the quarantine leave that their staff will have to, to go through. Um, it's, it's a bit early to tell what the effects are going to be. Uh, so I'm, um, I think we need to wait and see over there. But I do have a couple of points to make in this regard. First of all, the entire country has been offered 900 million euro in, in um, guarantees, in bank guarantees. Electrogas by itself was offered 360 million. So again, that puts it into some perspective. Secondly, I was expecting some kind of announcement with regards to the future of Air Malta. Um, mm. I think it's one of the, of the companies, you know, it's a crucial airline for us and it's suffering a great deal from all of this crisis and I was expecting some kind of at least acknowledgement of the situation and mm. unfortunately nothing was said and you know I was also expecting I mean not just the government to pitch in I mean I was expecting other other private enterprises to pitch in obviously oh. obviously businesses okay. are you know, they're not, they're not, you can't, there are businesses and then there are businesses right so some can afford more than others but we do have um, very wealthy businessmen in Malta and I was expecting some kind of social corporate responsibility from their end really? to pitch into their own reserves and aid the government in, 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 in combating the situation because at the end of the day this is something that's affecting everyone and everyone does need to pitch in. I don't know what you make of that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I had as much faith as you did in, in local wealthy businessmen jumping in. I mean, I generally heard, and I think I, I see a good reason for it, a lot of people putting the responsibility on the government shoulders, it seems. Mm -hmm. In a utopia, I, I think in a, in a perfect world, it would be great for the businessmen to jump in and step in. I think definitely they should if they have the means to, um, but I'm not surprised that they did it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. this 1.81 um, billion package, which you can find in a, a great breakdown on loveamalta.com, has to be one of the largest packets ever given by the Maltese government, right? Well, absolutely, but this is also one of the largest crises that the, con that the world has ever, that has ever faced. So it does make sense. Again, I, I don't know how much money exactly the government has to spend. It's, it's stating that it has more, right? So it's not just 1.8 billion, but more will be offered down the road. We don't know how long this crisis will last. Hopefully it will be resolved as quickly as possible, but we don't want to reach a situation either where the government throws all of its reserves now at the problem and then, you know, if, and then this could last a few months time and then all of a sudden the government has absolutely nothing um, to, 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 to fork out from. So 
Yeah. It's a very it's a it's a very it's a very troubling situation. I would not like to be in the prime minister's shoes right now. Uh, you know, especially going from a period of great economic growth and all of a sudden yeah, you're facing a, a period of of unemployment, right? I mean, of, of people are going to suffer. People are the social mobility is going, probably going to go in the other direction. It's very it's very sad and I I honestly think it's it's, it's worse than the actual virus itself. I don't know what you think. Well, I mean, uh, that's a big statement. Um, what's interesting in the story for me is that, correct me if I'm wrong, 150 million are being taken from the, um, the passports for sale scheme. Yeah. Um, so obviously a very, very controversial scheme where Malta was selling its passports to the highest bidders pr mm -hmm. pretty much. Um, 150 million of that money has now been put into this 1.81 uh, billion. 1.8. Um, so that's that's very very interesting. But anyway, yeah, um, I, no one's really complaining about the passport <laughs> scheme now. So again, obviously it was controversial, but I think everyone in a, in, a, in their own way is kind of grateful that it's there. You know, at least there is some money that we can fall back on. Moving on to um, uh, the coronavirus, COVID. So we actually have our two first elderly cases in Malta. We have a 70-year-old Maltese man and a 73-year-old man. Uh, we have 48 cases in total in Malta. Um, we haven't heard any announcements today yet, but... It's, it's, still, it's still early. We can expect an announcement later on, right? Yeah. Um, what's important to note is that according to the health authorities, none of these cases are critical. So mm. even though... Obviously, we all know that you know, the older you are, the more susceptible you are. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that because you're elderly, it's, you, it's, the case is critical. No. However, they are treating these cases, um, you know, they're more alert. They're treating them as they're, they're, you know, they're putting more effort into, into them, they said. Yeah. Um, 48 cases, none of them are critical, apparently. And in fact, the majority of them um, can actually be treated at home. So they all, all what, what Charming Gauchi, the superintendent of health, had said that they could be kept at home under quarantine, but the only reason they're being hospitalized is to make sure they're completely isolated. There you go. Up until now, again, I don't want to sound too optimistic about the situation because it's still very early days, but the numbers haven't spiked. Yes. And, when that's, and that's... And that's you know something that you know it's a it's a good thing. Like a lot of a lot of tests are happening, the numbers haven't spiked yet. Um, so fingers crossed. You know it might be worrying to see you know more and more cases coming into Malta every single day or being found in Malta every single day. But the worst thing would definitely be having one or two cases one day, and then the next day having a hundred cases. A spike like that would be yeah, that a massive shock to the healthcare system in Malta and something we wouldn't be able to really handle so as you said totally but moving on to some really other um sad news yeah so the <laughs> go for it man announce the yeah. sad news the eurovision is officially cancelled <laughs> eurovision 2020 yes poor destiny poor destiny i mean if you caught love and daily last week we actually had her on the show and she absolutely blew us away with her great voice like mm -hmm. i have heard it without any filters or effects on it it is actually a really powerful and stunning voice so <laughs> She had to go all the way to X Factor through boot camp and, and all those live shows the and now she up. can't... Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, it's very, it, it's, it's sad, right? Um, although we don't yet know whether she will automatically represent us next year. No. But, no, we don't know yet, but what we do know is that the song wow. they chose for her cannot be used. That's so exactly it. She's gonna have to, if she does represent us next year, she'll have to do a new song. Um, she, she posted a status, right? Yeah, she said... Um, I'm heartbroken and, and a little bit sad. Exactly, heartbroken and a bit sad. I mean, I can't even imagine how she must be feeling. She's been working so hard for this moment, just for it to be cancelled or at least postponed till next year. Um, it was supposed to be in Rotterdam in, the, yeah. in Holland. Um, so I guess we'll have to wait a few months. Yeah, I mean, then again, like, you know, everything that's happening in this period is getting cancelled. Yeah. The Euros, Euro 2020 is now Euro 2021. <laughs> there you go. So it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't like out of the blue, right? No, I mean, we were kind of expecting it. Um, but still, from everyone at Lovin, you know, 
Destiny, keep up there. We're still totally supporting you. Absolutely. Uh, moving on to a bit of a different story. Um, yesterday, but yeah, something that seems to keep happening every few weeks or months in Malta. Um, there was uh, a collapse, a construction collapse near a road in St. Julian's, near Pender Gardens, if you know where that is. Uh, apparently, in a few moments, the, this, this area just collapsed totally. People who were walking on the road minutes prior filmed it. You know, one person, I think we had even uploaded the, the video to our website. Someone who had just walked that road to go shopping, like five minutes later, returned to find the road totally obliterated. Um, no one was hurt, and reportedly no damage, uh, no property was damaged. Yeah. But I mean, come on, like the fact that a road just collapsed, no warning, and it's a very main road. I mean, yes. right there in St. Julian's. I mean, obviously, uh, the country's priority at the moment is dealing with the coronavirus, but this is also a, a problem. I mean, like, let's not forget that a few weeks ago, Miriam Patch was killed in her own home. Um, because of a construction accident and you know at the end of the day we can't just forget all the other issues that our country faces so this is one of the major ones as well yeah and what's a bit crazy about the story is apparently the developer um, involved in the excavation site near where the collapse happened yesterday may have also been involved in the collapse that led to the yeah. death of Miriam Potch yes um, yes he was arrested yesterday no he wasn't arrested yesterday he was arrested um, before and then he was he was released. Okay. Um, before, after the incident in involving Miriam Parch. Miriam Parch. Um, he hasn't been arrested yet, as I'm speaking. Uh, I mean, I don't want, I don't want to, to like you know say pointing fingers at anyone because we still don't know exactly who is to blame for either of the either of the cases. But again, there needs to be some responsibility. Yeah. Come, come on. I mean, yeah, just wait for our next story on the next insert building here to collapse. <laughs> Moving on. Yes, so the Minister of the Economy, Silvia Schembri, was... We don't know if he was made to apologise, but I highly suspect he was made to apologise after he said in Parliament that the government's priority is going to be to specifically to safeguard the jobs of Maltese yeah. workers and that third country nationals who end up unemployed have to go back to their country. <laughs> So let's let's play the clip of of Silvio Schembri's apology, which was in English because it was specifically directed at the at the foreign community. I'm sending out this message to set the record straight in relation to my comments in Parliament about foreigners who work and live in Malta. My choice of words was unfortunate, and I apologize if I hurt or offended anyone. Myself and the government are united in our respect to all workers no matter of their nationality. We are committed to assist employers, employees and self-employed in these difficult days, which I am certain we will overcome altogether. We are proud of the fact that the Maltese economy has not only offered a better standard of living for Maltese families, but it has also opened the door of opportunity for Europeans and third country nationals to build a future here. I would like to assure anyone who thought otherwise that we will not be terminating any permits to third country nationals who are in employment. I was neither referring to any European citizen working and living in Malta legally. I therefore urge all Maltese citizens who rent out their properties to be considerate in the present circumstances and be more flexible with rent rates until the economy regains its momentum. I thank you for your hard work throughout the past years and look forward to seeing our economy back on track in the interest of everyone living in Malta and Gozo. So that was Silvio Schembri's apology. What do you make of it, John? I mean, look, I'm going to actually talk about what happened before the apology. So in, in the space between his first comments and his apology, my feed, my, my Facebook feed was blowing up. I mean, you had memes about Silvio. You had foreign people who live and work in Malta posting about him, saying they had never even heard of him before, even though he's a minister. And all of a sudden now, the only idea they have of him is that he, yeah. might, he, he wants <laughs> him to go back to their country and whatnot. Um, uh -huh. So when the apology came, I think, I think it was well-timed. I'm sure he was under a lot of pressure to make it. Uh -huh. um, and the fact that it was in, Eng in English yeah. really speaks yeah. volumes. I mean, it's obviously everyone is very tense at the moment, especially people who are was scared that their jobs are on the line. It's not an easy situation. And um, it's very easy to find a scapegoat, right? And unfortunately, foreigners are the, the easiest scapegoat. 
but I really hope that this apology um, is you know, the start of the government realizing that we, you know, we, it doesn't pay anyone, you know, we might to, to, to you know, just you know, use these scapegoats, it might work politically in the short term, but at the end of the day, if we're going to, if our economy is to recover, we're definitely going to need, um, you know, the support of, of, of foreign people who have made more to their home as well. And I'm also glad to see that other prominent politicians, for example, Rosian Kotayar, mm. you know, actually stuck her neck out in favour of, of foreign people who, who work here. And that's very important because at the end of the day, we're all in this together. It's hard for us. I can actually imagine it might even be harder for some foreign people over here who don't even have the support networks no. that we do. So a bit of empathy doesn't hurt, you know? No, I mean, if you're feeling anxious during this time of the coronavirus, imagine being someone from the other side of the world, living, working here, trying to make a buck to send back, um, and all of this happens all of a sudden. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not an easy situation. So again, let's, as much as possible, let's try and, let's try and help each other out. The, uh, ending on a positive note. Yes. So, um, in case you've missed it, we've, we've launched season two of Love and Eat, featuring Jonathan <laughs> Chilia himself. <laughs> where basically he goes around Gozo sampling uh, <laughs> the best Gozatin pizzas right. around. And they are the best because he actually brought some to the office and, <laughs> and they were amazing. Obviously this was filmed before this whole crisis of the coronavirus erupted, um, but you know, we decided to publish it anyway as a, you know, basically to, to remind people of, of, the, of the beauty of, of, no, of normal life as well. A bit of a tribute to our Mota sister island of Gozo. Um, we headed up to Gozo, we went around to some of the most famous and most popular and some of the hidden gems in Gozo. We tried their yeah. pizza, their pizza ftira, yes. their pizzotto, all different types. So you can actually find the video which we premiered this week on our Facebook page as well as our website lavamalta.com. Yep. And stay tuned for some really interesting episodes coming up in the time of the coronavirus. <laughs> yeah, obviously restaurants are closed so we have to you know, make do with what we have, right? But <laughs> Love and Eats is still going to continue. That's it, that's damn right. So I think that brings us to the end of today's episode. For myself and Tim, have a day full of loving.